Okay. Um, so can everybody hear me okay, hopefully? Yes, sir. Right yes. On. Yes. Okay. All right. So, um, right. So if, if you guys are not familiar, um, this is the Midnight Sun Flycasters Group. So we're Interior Alaska's Fly Fishing Club. Um, it was established in 1976. And the goals for the club are to share knowledge, develop and refine skills, learn and promote the fly fishing and fish conservation in Interior Alaska. Um, and we've got some social media there. Uh, you can check us out on Facebook, on Twitter, and then we have a website as well. And some of the activities the club is best known for is, as you can see on that top left photo there, um, there's a kids camp that happens every summer. And that's where um, the club kind of teaches um, kids from 10 to 16, everything about fly fishing. So that includes like fly tying, fish identification, um, aquatic insect ID, and of course, fly casting. Also, the club does kind of periodic fly tying nights. Um, Oliver has been our point man on that this year. He's done a few get togethers and, and uh, I'm sure he'll let us know if there's anything else coming up. We'll get to the announcements in a minute and you can jump in if so. Um, also members like Fred, who's a uh, certified fly casting instructor have done uh, fly casting clinics for the club before. And so um, those happen, I think usually in the spring and periodically as well. Recently, we've also done a, uh, a virtual stream cleanup of the Chena River. Um, and, you know, there's other um, kind of community outreach things that we hope to, to do coming up soon as well. Um, so, let's see, getting into some announcements. Um, so, if you guys haven't bought your 2021 Alaska fishing licenses, definitely do that before you get out. And we're a couple of weeks into the, the new year now. So, hopefully, everybody's got that and it's been out there. I know in the past I've had to scramble to. To get one the day of going ice fishing or something because I had forgotten to buy one in the new year, but definitely do that so you don't get um, caught with a, an expensive ticket out there. Um, also, the comment period is open right now for Fishing Games annual stocking plan, and that's open through the end of the month. So if you have any thoughts on that or want to check it out, definitely um, look that up on the Fishing Game website. And kind of they're doing basically their usual stocking regimen where the local lakes are getting lots of rainbow trout and Chinook salmon, but they'll also be starting a lot of grayling stocking in 2023, which will be cool. And some lake trout stockings, uh, Harding Lake and the Delta Junction area lakes in 2022 and 2024. So if you have any thoughts on that or want to, you know, check out that plan, definitely do so. Like I said, comment period open is open until the end of the month on that. Um, uh, so I mentioned our kids camp this year, it's going to be June 11th through the 13th at Lost Lake Boy Scout Camp um, over towards Salsa, uh, Salja. And the applications are open for that. You can find those on our, our website if um, you've got no kid that wants to, to take up fly fishing and learn, learn all those skills. It's a great program. Um, our February meeting next month uh, will be fe February 10th. That'll be 6.30 p.m., also a virtual meeting over Zoom. And we're going to have Randy Brown, who's kind of a local legend uh, here in Fairbanks. He's a uh, fish, wild, fish and Wildlife Service fish biologist, and um, he's been doing a lot of research, you know, for decades now in the, in the Fairbanks area and, and out in Northwest and Arctic Alaska. So uh, he's going to talk to us about she fish and Dolly Varden research, and that'll be February 10th. We'll send out information about that soon. Um, but he's, you know, he's a very um, knowledgeable guy, uh, and I think it will, you know, be a make for a great presentation. So I'm looking forward to that. Um, yeah, also um, coming soon, we're gonna have a, an online membership purchase option, which has been lacking for a while. Um, we've had like the mail-in option and that, um, so we'll, we'll get something going online so people can more easily renew their, their membership. And then we might do a limited merchandise run using this new um, design here, which is um, a she fish and kind of our, in our, background that we've used in the past with the midnight sun and some boreal forest trees there. Um, so I'll go ahead and open it up to Will and Oliver and anybody else that might have any other announcements. Oliver, I don't know if there's any fly tying night announcements coming up or anything like that, but if anybody wants to jump in, um, you can do that now. Uh, as far as fly tying, can everyone hear me? Yeah. Okay. As far as fly tying uh, nights go, um, I, I'll be willing to set um, more up. We just really haven't re been getting a ton of participation. I know that um, the most recent one was probably because of the holidays. I'm not too, um, so I'm not too worried about it, but um, 
yeah, I mean, I can set them up. I just, you know, we, we, it's no fun if it's just me and Will and <laughs> yeah, I hear you. Will from, uh, from big rays. So yeah, I, yeah, I will. Um, but I'll, I'll, you know, I'll keep setting them up. Big rays does them every Wednesday. So, um, <clears throat> you know, they've, they've, um, brought in a couple guys that aren't involved with midnight sun as well for a couple of the places or for a couple of the uh, meetings. And I bet a few buddies show up too, but, um, yeah, no one from Midnight Sun has actually shown up to one yet. So, um, yeah, we'll set them up. Um, maybe we could do one at uh, at Hoodoo or or um, take a take the back room at Black Spruce Brewing Company. So, you know, the people that don't tie can at least come out and hang out and uh, have a beer. So, I'll work with them and see if I can't get something else set up. That sounds great. Yeah. Um... Cool. Just do it at as much as you want. If people aren't showing up, I, I certainly <clears throat> wouldn't ask you to, to run it unless you want to. So, but that, yeah, something like the, the black spruce would be cool because you can kind of distance from people a little bit and they do have, I think they have some benches and tables that you could put vices on back there, maybe with like some cloth or something so you don't damage their, their bench, but that could work nicely. Okay. Anybody else have anything? Will, Fred, Dave? All right. Okay. So I'll go ahead and move on to the presentation. So today I'll be uh, talking about beyond trout fly fishing, New Zealand. Um, so I was lucky enough to spend three years over in New Zealand doing my PhD uh, in freshwater ecology and, you know, having that long of a, a time over there, um, I was able to dive into some of the fishing opportunities, or I should say a lot of the fishing opportunities. Um, and so, you know, many people know that New Zealand's uh, kind of an internationally known um, destination trout fishery, but there's a lot of other species that are really, really fun to go after, great game fish. Um, and so I'll, I'll be talking uh, mainly about them, but also some trout today. And um, I know the, the club has had people talk about New Zealand fishing in the past and they focused on trout. So hopefully this will uh, be some new, new material for um, folks that may have seen those presentations in the past. So here's kind of an outline of what I'll be going over today. I'll talk a little bit about the New Zealand geography um, for those who aren't familiar with the layout of the, of the country. I'll go into some saltwater fly fishing opportunities. I'll talk about the freshwater uh, fly fishing, including the trout. I'll go over some regulations, licenses, and then information about guides, um, some just general fishing tips, and then some travel tips. So, um, so here's where we are in relation to New Zealand, you can see us up there in Fairbanks, the top of the screen, and then all the way down there at the bottom of the world is New Zealand. Um, and of course, right now it's their summer and our winter. So given that it's quite a nice place to go for a destination fishing trip um, during our long Alaskan winters, it's a awesome place to go to. And, you know, kind of there's some semi-tropical areas that can get really warm and nice down there uh, for a winter trip. If you're going down there, obviously um, they're pretty locked down with the COVID situation right now. So I don't think they're letting anybody um, outside of the country in unless you're quarantining a lot. So kind of the information here will be hopefully um, uh, helpful for people that want to plan a trip for next year, next winter, potentially, because hopefully the, uh, the travel will be opened up back by then. Um, you know, we'll see what happens with COVID. But this time of year, it's a great great time to start dreaming about some tropical trips, you know, as we're trapped in our cabins uh, in the cold. So hopefully that'll I'll offer a little bit of an escape for people today, showing you some of these awesome fishing opportunities down south. If you're uh, going down there, usually people fly through, um, you know, the, the fastest way from here in Fairbanks is to go to Anchorage and then Honolulu and then straight to New Zealand. But there's other options like going through the lower 48 and through Australia and through Fiji too. It's all pretty expensive and kind of long flights, but you know, if you've got the, the miles or whatever and, and some time, it's a during the winter, it's a great place to check out. Highly recommend it. So here's <clears throat> zooming in on the country of New Zealand, and you can see there's two main islands. There's the North Island, where um, probably I think it's like three quarters of the, the country's population um, reside in. So it's much more populous. There's also fewer mountains there, it's kind of more rolling countryside. And that's where some of the bigger cities are like Wellington and Auckland. Um, and then the South Island of New Zealand has you know, only a, a quarter to a third of the population of the country. So it's much less populous. 
And uh, there's a lot going on down there um, that you can see kind of that spine of mountains along the middle of the island. Um, so those are the Southern Alps and it can get quite mountainous. There's also that really green patch that's kind of narrow on the west side of the island and that's the New Zealand or the uh, West Coast rainforest. Um, and then on the east side is kind of arid plains and rolling hills. Um, the North Island, I guess I should mention, is known for its volcanic features as well, whereas the South Island has less of that. But there's a lot of cool stuff going on there. And I'll, I'll kind of, you know, so I when I was there, I lived in the South Island in Christchurch. If, if you can see my pointer, it's this little kind of nub that sticks out from the, uh, the South Island on the East Coast there, <clears throat> kind of midway down. It's right near there. So I didn't spend a lot of time on the, the North Island, and there are a lot of good fishing opportunities there, but I never really fished up there. There was just so much to do in the South Island. So that's what I'll be focusing on um, today for the most part. So look, just giving you guys idea, an idea of what the landscape's like there. Um, here's some pictures from the North Island. And I won't go into, this, this is about all I'll show, like I said, from the North Island because I didn't spend a lot of time there. But you can see on that top left there, there's a lot of kind of rolling pasture land. That's actually the Hobbit movie set there. Um, then the bottom left, is Tongariro National Park, where there's a lot of volcanic features, some really cool hikes there, um, still some active volcanoes and geothermal spots. Uh, you can see on the kind of the top middle picture, there's kind of some rainforest with ferns and that sort of thing. So you see some of that in the North Island. And then those other pictures give an idea of some other scenes, like the, the city of Wellington there on the right. Um, and lots of, there's lots of big lakes and, and big rivers up there. And so that's about all I'll say for the, the North Island. The South Island, which is my, you know, stomping ground or, or was when I was there, has a lot of diverse landscapes. So like you can see on that top left there, you get these kind of scrubby um, river bottoms, lots of the, the native beach forest, and then it goes up to these beautiful Southern Alp mountains that are often snow covered. Um, the, the biggest mountain in New Zealand is Mount Cook, which is around 13,000 feet, which doesn't sound too high, but you know, when you think about the edge of New Zealand, obviously is, is sea level. So it, the, the country has quite a, a rise to it to get up to that high point. So there are some really, really nice craggy mountains there. Um, and then the next photo down from that on the left in the middle far left one is one of the west coast of New Zealand rivers, which is, that's kind of what people think about when they hear the international, you know, trout fishing destination of New Zealand. You see these like kind of these rivers that look like gems, the, that beautiful green water and the dense forest. Um, and so that's a you know, one of the iconic New Zealand scenes there. There's also that bottom left hand uh, picture kind of shows some tussock grassland, pasture land that's more um, typical of the east coast of the South Island. You can see that orange hut with uh, the mountains around it. That's one of the public use huts um, that New Zealand has. And there's hundreds of these huts um, that are distributed around. So sorry about that. My dog's making a weird noise. <laughs> Um, also, there's the, the north end of the South Island that's all kind of semi-tropical, and I'll talk a lot about that um, when we talk about the amberjack fishery coming up. That's that top middle photo up, up there. And there's just some other scenes. There's pasture land. There's a lot of limestone and caves. Um, there's some cool uh, jungly looking west coast um, areas there, and I'll get more into that as we go. So first, I'm going to talk about the saltwater fly fishing opportunities in New Zealand. And <clears throat> these can be found um, on the flats, of course. There's uh, reef fishing and then also river mouths are a common place to go saltwater fly fishing. And most people fish uh, on the salt from the shore, but there are, um, are boating opportunities, particularly on the flats fishing for the amberjack, which I'll talk about where you can really have an advantage if you're in a boat. Saltwater fly fishing isn't too popular with fly anglers there, except for that this amberjack fishery, which is kind of an underground flats fishery that's just starting to get um, a lot of exposure. It's only been around for about 10 years or so, and now it's starting to, to get some exposure with international anglers. Um, and usually people are wet wading, so just shorts and, and wading boots. Um, but if it's cold or you're going in deep or whatever, you can use waders or a wetsuit. Right, um, so I'll talk about the amberjack first. Uh, in New Zealand, they refer to them as yellowtail kingfish. And these fish are pretty widely distributed um, this subspecies that occurs in New Zealand, you can also find in Australia, South Africa, along the coast there, um, a lot of the Pacific Islands, but there's similar species throughout the world, basically. Um, and they're kind of like a tuna-like fish, basically very fast, streamlined. Um, for this flats fishery in New Zealand, a really nice fish is a 50-inch, 30-pound fish, which is pretty much what that one is in the picture there. 
Uh, most of them are smaller than that but in the flats, although they do get much bigger, but they don't often come into shallow water with the really bigger ones. These guys are predatory, so they're chasing bait fish and uh, sometimes invertebrates in the, in the shallow flats. And if you're fly fishing for them, you're going to want a 10 weight or a larger uh, fly rod and reel. Lots of backing because they're so fast and they take out a lot of line. So probably, you know, 300 yards of backing if you can get it on there. Um, I'd say 30 plus pound test tippet if you're using that. And they do, their acceleration is so intense that um, you do probably want like a shock tippet or even, you know, something like 50 pound test on there just to make sure you don't lose anything. That's, you know, when I was fishing, that's what I would use. I would just go big um, because they aren't particularly leader shy unless it's super clear water and they're getting pressured a lot. So you can get away with some really heavy um, line and then you, have, you can kind of have that peace of mind uh, to, that they're not going to get away. Also, if you're catching releasing these fish, the heavier the line, the less time you're going to have to fight them and the less exhausted they're going to be and the better chances uh, for, of survival post-release. So yeah, you're definitely going to want the heavy duty reel with a really good drag. Like I said, they really take off really fast acceleration, lots of runs. It's a very exciting fight. Um, and for these guys, we're using uh, large poppers or streamers, typically floating line, maybe with like a split shot or maybe a little bit of, of sink tip on there, but it's, it's the flats. So, um, you know, you don't need much sink to get down to these guys. You can see an example of one of those streamers in the fish's mouth there. Um, and yeah, they're incredibly fast and hard fighters. So, so that's why they're such a popular fish to go after. Um, and it's cool right now because this fishery is not super well known. Like I said, it's just starting to get kind of international um, interest. So, uh, you know, it's kind of a, it's kind of a neat underground fishery in that way. So um, on the South Island, uh, the season for going after these guys is December through March. They kind of range down to the North end of the South Island during the summer months in New Zealand, which is December through March. And kind of the focus of the fishery is Golden Bay, which you can see on the map there, kind of pointed out by the arrow on the north end of the South Island. Um, the kingfish are distributed you know, around the coast on the North Island pretty much year round. And I don't know too much about the, fisher, the fishery for them there. I don't hear, I haven't heard as much about it, but you could potentially get them you know, any time of the year if you found a good spot on the North Island. But most people go to this, this Golden Bay in the South Island. And it's a pretty cool fishery because you're looking for these uh, stingrays that are moving around the flats. Uh, and um, the kingfish are ray riding is what it's called. <clears throat> and so these stingrays, which they're giant stingrays, they can, you know, I think they probably approach hundred pounds, some of them. They're just kind of cruising around um, trying to, you know, find bait fish and prey in, the, in the, mud, the mud of the flats. And these kingfish basically just follow them around and wait for them to spook, um, you know, prey out of the mud. And then those kingfish will pick them off. So it's called ray riding. And it's uh, <clears throat> helpful for the fly anglers because it's really easy to spot the stingrays, whereas the kingfish blend in so well, it's pretty hard to find them. So all you have to do is, is look for these rays moving around on the flats and hope that there's some kingfish that are associated with them. And sometimes there won't be, and sometimes there might be three kingfish you know, following one ray. So it's pretty, it's pretty exciting and a pretty unique uh, fishery. Also, you know, if there's not a lot of ray activity, um, you can look for bait fish blowups, you know, places where bait fish are breaking the surface. And that's a good, good um, indication that there might be some kingfish or other predatory fish you can catch on the fly. And for this fishery, um, like the sandy and lightly weeded areas are best. And, you know, you're going to cast um, in front of the rays and into any bait fish action. And then uh, you strip your fly back as fast as possible. These fish are so fast um, that you want to really move that fly to catch their interest. And some people will even like stick the, the rod into the crook or under their armpit basically and they'll strip with both hands to get a super fast retrieve because um, these fish are just, you know, it, the faster the fish are going and your fly is going, um, the less chance they have to kind of examine it and decide that they're not going to hit it. So they just instinctively commit if it's a really fast retrieve. So that's the way to do it. And for this one, um, you want the calm, really calm and clear water. That's pretty critical for success. Although you can do okay um, as long as you find those rays because you can see them even if it's windy and, and not that sunny out. You can still spot the rays because they're so big. Um, so zooming into that Golden Bay area on the north end of the South Island, you can see it's, um, it's pretty protected, which is why it's such a good fishery. You know, I think it's always a, there's a good chance that it's going to be calm and the water's going to be clear and there's not going to be a lot of silt kicked up. And you, and you can see the, the town of Collingwood there 
and then up to the little town of Puponga up near that, that kind of um, spit. That's pretty much the section that people are fishing, those flats right along the shoreline there. You can see that the spit has some really nice flats as well, but that's a uh, marine protected area and you're not allowed to wade around there. So that's where some place where if you had a boat, you could potentially access some really amazing uh, flats that you know the, the guys on foot can't get to. Here's another view of those flats, kind of a nice scalloped sloping flats with a little bit of vegetation, but it's mostly sand and, and silt. Another view of uh, some nice flats in the area there. And here's your like the angler's eye view. You can see little bits of little islands of vegetation here and there, but the water is pretty clear. You're kind of wading, um, usually up to your waist, but you can go deeper or shallower. The fisher or anywhere in that zone. I always try to stay, you know, somewhere where I can at least keep my arm clear of the water if I'm casting, so that I can get the most casting distance as possible. And um, you look for, you you know, in this picture, if you saw like a big black moving spot, that would be your stingray. And you'd have to try to kind of wade as fast as you can, which is tough because these stingrays move along faster than you expect. So you're kind of trying to sprint through this water, like in slow motion almost, of course, because you're in there pretty deep and try to get, um, you know, get close enough that you can get your cast in front of those stingrays. Um, you know, or you can stay closer to the beach and just try to look for bait fish blow ups and then kind of people like sprint down the beach and then try to get out there and intercept the fish. Because these fish are moving around so much and the rays are too. Um, you really have, if you try to like just chase after one straight up, they're going to out, outpace you. So you kind of got to calculate your angle of attack and go after them and try to intercept them as best as you can. So here's some photos I stole online because I didn't have a lot of good photos myself of some of this because I was busy fishing rather than taking photos. But um, this is, you know, um, those flats and kind of an example of what you could do with a boat. You could get away from the main, uh, the main crowds and, and access some good spots. And, does require some some pretty di good distance casting and if there's wind it's tough too um, unless you can really time your runs well to like to intercept the fish so that you don't have to cast too far those rays are a little bit spooky though especially if there's a lot of fishing pressure they kind of get spooked by a lot of fishermen and they won't let you get very close so it's good to you know cast as far as you can so that way you have more time to strip as well and more time for the kingfish to follow you and then you're not going to spook the rays either and while you're if while you're doing this flats fishing, there's also rays that are buried um, in the sand. So people say you should shuffle your feet rather than taking big stomps so that you um, kind of let the ray know that you're coming with that shuffling rather than stepping right onto it and, and receiving a sting, which would be bad. So here's some, some more photos I stole from different YouTube videos and whatnot, or the, um, you know, given the attribution of the videos there. But this shows what those kingfish are doing uh, when they're following those rays and kind of what you see as a fisherman. It's pretty cool um, and it's pretty exciting when you see those fish riding one of the rays and you know you've got a good chance. There's some nice uh, YouTube videos of that too. Here's a couple of photos that I, uh, from my own um, fishing out there and you can see very shallow, nice clear water, a little bit of chop, but uh, not enough so that you wouldn't be able to see what's going on below the surface. That one on the right side, you can see there's a nice drop off there. And that was a pretty productive spot where rays would be coming in out of the deeper water, um, just onto the edge of that, that shelf. And then those kingfish would be following them. Uh, here's a picture of a, a friend hooked up to one of the fish. Um, so yeah, it's, it's pretty exciting. And, and you're just waiting around in a tropical paradise for the most part. So you can't really can't beat it. So it's a really fun time. There, just a couple last pictures before I move on. So here's some of the examples of the flies that we use on the left there. There's one of those big poppers on the bottom and then a big streamer on the top. Uh, and there's a couple of fish that I kept for the, for the dinner table. They're very good eating, but you want to bleed them out because they do have a lot of blood. They have a lot of aerob aerobic muscle. So you want to get that blood out of there. Um, super good eating, kind of almost somewhere in between like a white meated fish and tuna. Um, but they're, yeah, they're super good. Okay. Moving on to the next species. So this is a Kahawai. And these are kind of like mini little amber jacks. They, they look similar. Um, but I don't think they're you know, evolutionarily very similar, but they're streamlined. They're very fast. They're predatory. Um, and they can get you know, between three and 10 pounds. And they're really, they're really fun to go after. You, you find them near river mouths um, and on the flats throughout New Zealand. So you know, any, almost any time of the year, you can find these Kahawai at river mouths along the coast, which is cool. Um, they're, they also strike really aggressively and they're hard fighters. For example, I was at this river mouth, you can see in the photo there in the background, I was just 
messing around on my phone and I had uh, the fly kind of off the end of the tip of my rod just drifting in the tide and one nailed it right there and, and almost, you know, pulled the rod out of my hand. So it was pretty, they'll, they'll come right in close and they just, they hit really hard. Um, for these guys, I would say use an eight weight or larger uh, fly rod and then 20 pound test or larger um, tippet. And again, you're going to want a good drag and also, you know, bigger is better as far as the tippet strength, because like you can see in that picture in the back, um, the water is a bit cloudy. So they're really not leader shy at all. And so you can go big and, and then, you, you know, have complete peace of mind about not losing them. And for these, um, usually use big streamers with uh, like a split shot or a sink, a sink tip to get down a little bit. Uh, you don't need to be down too far. It's usually pretty shallow. And then a very swift, aggressive strip in, or you can even swing in the current if it's a river mouth or if the tide's going in or out, that can be really effective. And moving on. Here's, so here's just some photos of Kawai fishing. So you can see in this photo, this is right near Christchurch. Um, so there's quite a few people out there, mostly spin fishermen. Um, there's not many people that fly fish for them because it, it is kind of hard to reach them when you've got a bunch of spin fishermen you're competing with. But in this photo, the, the river mouth is quite wide. Um, so that makes it difficult if it's like that. So I like to fish for Kawai around low tide, about an hour before and after low tide is best because then the fish are, the river mouth's more narrow and the fish are more concentrated and they seem to like those times. Uh, okay, moving on. Yeah, so here's my friend Rick. He's actually a fish biologist in Yakutat. Uh, but you can see here, that's that same river mouth, but much narrower, right? Like, so this is closer to low tide and he's got hooked into a nice Kahawai there, which has given him definitely a good workout. That's on a seven weight, I think. So it's maybe a little undergunned. Um, you can see in the background there, there's kind of a line of spin fishermen who are actually fishing for um, sea run salmon as well as the Kahawai. And we found that like getting away from the, you know, the combat fishing was good because you can't cast as far as the spin fishermen. So. Um, either like wading out um, in a wetsuit or, or wet wading or whatever to get away from them so you can cast out and get a chance at the fish is a good way to go. And it seems like the Kahawai um, kind of have feeding frenzy. So there's like a 20 minute period where they're just, it's just amazing fishing. You're, you know, catching one almost every cast if you got your line in the water. And then there's a lot of slow periods where you might pick up one or here or there. So if you can kind of um, get things dialed in at a certain river mouth, you can have a lot of success. You know, like I think I got, you know, seven of them in one night. And then I also got skunked, you know, a fair number of times. But um, yeah, even if you're like in with the spin fishermen during the, the feeding frenzy, which usually lasts about 15, 20 minutes, you're still catching them because there's so many fish in there and they're so aggressive. That, this spot that uh, I'm showing pictures of is nice because it was only, you know, a 20 minute drive from where I, um, where I lived. So, you know, compared to like driving an hour or two to get to a really nice trout location, this was a nice little backyard um, fishery to go to, especially when in New Zealand, like it cost a hundred bucks to fill up my Subaru legacy, you know, probably th almost three times as much as what it would cost here in Alaska. So trips were, you know, I had to kind of budget for them if I was going to do a big trout trip. So this was nice to have something that was just in the backyard to go after. And those, the Kauai are amazing eating too. We would actually make ceviche with them uh, most of the time. They've got really nice firm uh, white meat and so excellent table fare. Few more pictures of them and uh, move on to, I'll just briefly touch on some of the other fishes that you can find in saltwater. And this is pretty much like, you're not gonna target these. You just might happen to catch one while you're out fishing for something else like kingfish or kawaii. Um, on the top right there is flounder. So there's a lot of flounder that you, that you probably would pick up when you're kawaii fishing. Uh, and then that bottom left photo is a red snapper. Um, and they, you can encounter them sometimes when you're kingfish uh, fishing on the flats, although they typically like deeper water. I never saw one or was able to hook into one. And then there's also barracuda that you account, encounter sometimes. Um, so that's about it for saltwater fish. So getting into some freshwater fish. I'll take a drink here just a sec. Right, <clears throat> so freshwater is interesting because there's a mix of native and non-native fishes in New Zealand. And um, in uh, freshwater, you've got large lakes, you've got big rivers, backcountry streams, alpine lakes, um, hydro canals, and even urban fishing. So there's a lot of different um, settings that you can go fly fishing. In the South Island, most areas are accessible by road or by hiking on one of their um, many, many trails, except for the Fiordland area, which I won't talk about much because I never did much down there, but that's kind of the New Zealand wilderness area where you need a boat or, or even a plane or a lot of hiking to get to some of the really remote trout, stream, trout streams. 
And for freshwater, you're typically shore fishing. There's not really much float fishing. Um, may, maybe on a lake, you'd be out in a boat, but probably not fly fishing. That'd be people trolling or jigging. So yeah, most of it's like, uh, you know, wading along spot and stock is what New Zealand is known for. So you're looking for the fish as you hike up the river and then trying to make a stock on them and, and make a cast. And that's super, um, super fun, but also super challenging as I'll talk about. There are some more um, like the lakes and then some more bigger turbid rivers where you can do more like what you do in Alaska, which is kind of, you know, you can stay more in one spot and do a lot of dredging with nymphs and, and that sort of thing and blind fishing and that can be productive there. But what I was told early on um, for freshwater, you know, for, for fishing trout and rivers, um, blind fishing pretty much you're wasting time. You need to spot the fish to have any luck of actually catching anything. So that's a really nice um, West Coast New Zealand river there, kind of, you know, what you would see in a brochure for New Zealand fly fishing. So the trout, I will, you know, get into trout a little bit. That's not the focus of the presentation, but I have so much material on trout because that's mainly what I went after that I have to um, talk about it a fair bit. But so trout have been in uh, New Zealand about 150 years. They were introduced by Europeans when they, they showed up. Um, and in New Zealand, it's mostly brown and rainbow trout that you find. There are a few brook trout in some of the headwater streams, although they don't get very big and there are not many of them. Excuse me. The trout are highly valued by international anglers. I'm sure many of you have you know, heard of New Zealand as a, a trophy trout destination. Uh, but also the, the Kiwis, or what we call the New Zealanders, are um, also avid fishermen as well. So it's a big domestic um, fishery. And even like the indigenous folks or the Maori in New Zealand uh, like to catch trout a lot. So it's pretty ingrained in the, the New Zealand culture is this, this trout fishing. Um, however, trout are reviled by, by certain conservationists and environmentalists, most of them who don't you know, fish, they don't necessarily see the value, the recreational value of trout because uh, the trout do predate heavily on the native fish in New Zealand, um, which are you know, usually much smaller other than eels. And so the trout can eat those little fish and also outcompete for food with them. So there is a, a worry there. Although native fish populations for the most part are doing well, there are some endangered um, or threatened native fishes there, but it seems like a pretty good equilibrium has, has been um, set at this point. And so you can see a couple of maps there. Those are the, that's the distribution of brown trout on the left in New Zealand. And you can see they're pretty much throughout both the North and South Island. And then rainbow trout on the right. And they're, they're a much smaller, um, they take up a much smaller area. So some, some rivers can have um, one or the other, like they might, a certain river might be only rainbows or only browns, and then some have a mix of both of them. So it's kind of fun to mix things up. And I did, I kind of like the rainbows because um, they're much more forgiving and willing to bite than the brown trout. So if I needed a little confidence boost after a tough day on a, on a brown trout river, I would go and fish for some rainbows. Um, yeah, and so the trout is, is like the spot and stock fishing. Like I said, you're using super long, thin leaders. And um, most people like to use a dry dropper setup where you have a dry fly with a length of tippet down from the hook and then a nymph or two down below that. And that's nice because, um, you know, if the dry fly goes under the water, you, that's basically your indicator to know that something's hit the nymph. And you also have the potential that a, a fish is going to come up and hit your dry fly. So I ran that rig um, quite a bit. Also, people can use multiple nymphs with um, usually subtle fiber indicators with a little bit of floatant on the fiber. The fish are super leader shy and, and they're very shy of any indicator. So it, I would usually use like brown um, fiber leaders or uh, brown fiber indicators and uh, you know, very thin tippet. Um, but in the, some of those big turbid rivers, you can use like a thingamabobber indicator and a, bunch, and a big nymph or something like that and blind fish. So that can be pr um, productive in those places where there's a lot of, of trout, like high density of trout. People, there's a lot of people you know, from around the world that fish in New Zealand. And so the European nymphing has been really popular there, um, especially for some of those turbid rivers. And that's what, you know, you have super long, fly rods and, and even longer leaders. And, um, you know, it gives you a lot of sensitivity and, and ability to, to be successful nymphing. I got to try a little bit of that, but I never did much. Um, but yeah, a lot of Europeans that travel there or even live there will be using that. So you'll see them out on the, on the creeks. Uh, most of the, the flies that people use there are these small tungsten bead headed nymphs. So they're pretty small, but they're also really heavy to get down um, deep to the trout. And, yeah, there's not like much of a um, hatch matching that you're doing. It's mostly just 
digging through your fly box and trying to find something that the trout you, uh, you've found that you, you've spotted and stocked um, will hit. There are some bigger rivers um, in certain places where hatches do come off and you want to match the hatch, but most of it's just trying out different things. Um, and then there's also, if you get real lucky, you can find fish that'll hit cicadas because in New Zealand, um, every summer the, there's a big burst of um, cicadas that emerge basically. And, you know, like in the lower 48 in the US, we get cicadas every few years, there's a big year. But in New Zealand, every year is a, is a pretty good year. And then some years are better than most. But um, yeah, so that you can get cicada flies. And, and sometimes, especially the rainbows, will hit that. And that's really exciting. There's also some mousing to do there. I never got into that. That's kind of a pretty, um, you know, it has to be the right situation to do that. OK. So I'm just going to go through some scenes of trout fishing, and then I'll move on. Um, here's a nice West Coast River, kind of your Typical one, like I said, you might see in a brochure that beautiful green water, really clean stones and, and really good visibility. Um, there's a nice trout caught here right where this little tributary came in. But basically, you're kind of walking up the sides of the stream and um, trying to spot those fish before they spot you. And then you you know, probably have maybe a few casts, if it's a brown trout, um, to give your presentation before they spook. And it's, it's pretty... Uh, tough because if anybody's fished it, even, you know, a couple days before you in certain rivers, those trout will be extra wary and extra spooky. So, and if, if somebody's ahead of you on the river, you might as well just quit and go somewhere else um, because those fish will be completely spooked. They're super wary. Okay. Here's another nice West Coast, New Zealand stream, beautiful pool here. Um, and the trout could be anywhere in here. They like, especially brown trout, like the slow moving water. You're not going to find them much in riffles, so you're mainly looking for pools and runs, but they can be very close to shore and in shallow water in the pools. So it took me quite a while to learn <clears throat> to be patient and to walk really, really slow and wear muted colors. Um, you know, some I'm, I'm not a very patient person when it comes to like walking and hiking, so usually I'm just blasting by things, but it, it does pay to, to uh, take some time here when you're fishing New Zealand streams and, and just walk really slowly and scan, give a really good look. Because uh, the, there's no worse feeling than seeing a, you know, like a seven pound trout dart out from an easy spot where you could have had an awesome cast you just, if you had just gone a little slower. Here's some more, more scenes you might see. Um, this is just, uh, so this is one of the west coast of the New Zealand, of New Zealand streams. This river is one of those deep turbid ones. And these guys are doing the European nymphing. So these are pals I fished with quite a bit, one from Slovenia and one from the Czech Republic, but they were really into the European nymphing. And, and this river um, had high trout density. So you could spend you know, a couple hours like in a spot like this and, and catch fish regularly. And I'll say that they probably caught two fish to every one of mine or, or better um, with their European nymphing technique compared to me with just a indicator and some nymphs. So it's definitely an effective um, method if, if you can get good at it and if you wanna buy all that extra gear and fly rods and stuff. Here's some more photos of uh, different New Zealand streams. This one uh, is really beautiful on the left here. It's one of those West Coast streams. And at this point, it was too deep to, to wade up through the stream. So we actually had to cl climb up the cliffs there on the side. And then we were able to get back to the river about a quarter mile up. But you know, doing something like that, where you do a little bushwhacking, that can really get you um, beyond the competition. And if you can find some trout that don't often get pestered by anglers, then you'll have a great time. That photo on the right there is of my dad. Um, he's, he's found a nice brown trout. Uh, you can't quite see it on this photo, but he's making a, some cast to it. And so that's a, the proper way to kind of line up so that you get a really good drift um, coming back towards you in the current. If you get any sort of drag on your, on your even your nymph or your dry fly, the fish is probably not gonna hit it. So um, that was a tough day. Dad got a, a few strikes, but we didn't, didn't end up landing. Uh, I think he got a smaller brown trout on that one, but. Yeah, I'll say that, you know, the learning curve is super steep when you go there. So like it took me probably six months after I arrived in New Zealand to get really um, proficient at catching fish. And that's because I didn't really do any preparation for it. But if you're going to go there, you're, you're going to want to do a lot of casting practice. So it's because you got to, you got to hit it, you know, you got to put your, um, your setup just in front of the fish enough that it's not going to spook it. And then it's going to have time to, for the fish to see it well as it goes by. And with a very wary brown trout, you might get like from one to five attempts basically at him and, and before he spooks and won't hit anything. So it, it uh, definitely pays to practice and to get things dialed in if you can. All right. Okay, yeah, so here is um, a little different scene. This is uh, like one of the 
kind of in the edge of the, the Southern Alps in the mountains, more on the east um, side of the South Island of New Zealand, where you're in more like an arid area with a lot of scrub and a lot of that limestone. That's my buddy Rick again from Yakutat um, waiting across there. But this is, these streams are nice because you, um, you have a little more room on the bank to walk around. So that, but there is, um, tends to be more people fishing these because it's closer to the population centers, but some really nice country to fish there. Uh, there's my dad again. So this is a really cool kind of jungly West Coast river. It, it almost felt like a velociraptor was going to pop out of the trees there at any second when we were fishing it. Uh, it's pretty cool. Um, he he got hooked into a nice brown trout here uh, and it ended up popping off just because, you know, it spit the hook because he had a little bit too much slack in the line, I think. But that was a really cool place to try fishing. It just seemed like, you know, a spot that a trout wouldn't be. You know, it just seemed like so alien, but it was, it was such such a cool spot. And here's more of those like East Coast foothill rivers. You can see a lot of that scrub and kind of foothill, um, you know, limestone, that sort of thing. Almost looks like something you might see in uh, Southwest Montana or something. Um, very fun places to fish though. And then of course there's urban fishing too. So this is just a stream that flows through Christchurch and there's some nice brown trout in that. And the benefit of this was, like I said, it was so expensive to uh, drive anywhere um, far out, you know, for one of those backcountry streams uh, that just having something in your backyard is really awesome to, to go out for an evening or something and, and do some fishing. And this uh, fishing in these urban streams helped me a lot too, because I could work on my casting, like at the beginning of the season, that sort of thing, work on my accuracy with pretty low stakes where, you know, it's not like I'm, you know, fishing to a 10 pound fish in a backcountry river that I've hiked hours to get to. It's just, I went there for 20 minutes. And so if I miss the fish, no big deal. So that's a good, a great place to um, practice some fishing and, and, you know, have kind of a low stakes environment. And a lot of people in New Zealand overlook these urban streams too. So it can be kind of a fun uh, place to check out. And there is some good lake fishing too. Um, there's a lot of really large lakes in the South Island. This one is um, one that's very close to the ocean right near Christchurch. And so this one has um, sea run as well as resident trout and also perch, which I'll get into um, in a minute here. And here's what you're looking for if you're, uh, if you're fishing upstream on one of the, the spot and stock rivers. You can see that dark shape there is a nice brown trout. Um, usually they're not that uh, obvious. You, they're usually blend in a little well, and especially the rainbow trout blend in super well. So this guy might just be kind of sulking or something after he got caught by somebody else. But um, but that's definitely what you're looking for. And uh, and then you want to kind of stalk within range. And then sometimes I'll like wade out into the stream a little bit. So I'm directly behind the fish so that I don't, uh, so he can't see me at all, right? His vision's totally forward. And then I also can get a really nice uh, drag free float if I'm just directly behind him in the current. But you have to be careful about making too much splashing and, and that sort of thing that can spook him away. And these, you can see some of these little scrubby bushes here. There's a lot of little spiky, uh, nasty plants that will really do a number on your fly line. So that can be really frustrating when you, your fly lines wrapped around these spiky trees and there's a giant trout, you know, just a few meters away. So definitely a lot of uh, fun, but some challenges too. Right. Ah, yes. Um, so these guys, this was, uh, this was actually in Mount Aspiring National Park where we saw these and it, it was about, I think a week before the season opened. So of course they were just sitting there kind of flaunting their, their freedom right along the trail. But um, you know, this is what you're looking for as well. This would be a very hard presentation to make on these fish because that water is so clear and shallow. They pretty much spook at any um, touch of your leader or anything on the surface, but it's fun to see them in water like that. Here's another one. So this is a rainbow trout in one of those um, East Coast streams. And if you can get up on a high vantage point like we are here, the trout aren't going to see you and you can see down into the water better and then kind of plan out your, your stock on the trout. And it's good to have a, um, good to have a uh, buddy along too. Like I usually like to go in a team where one person's fishing and then the other person's um, kind of trying to spot fish for you. And that can be really helpful too. Like you could have somebody where this photo is taken from right now and then the fisherman could be down on the ground and then you could kind of um, yell or signal down to them what the fish is doing, if it's still there, um, you know, how it's responding to the fly, if, if the spotter can see that. 
So that can really help. And just having two eyes helps a lot too, um, to be able to spot the fish before it spots you. Okay. Here's one more uh, fish there. You might be able to see him um, just behind one of those big boulders. You can see his green head and brown body. And that's a very typical spot you would find a fish. This is a great spot here because there's a little bit of current. So he's probably not gonna see you because of that distortion on the surface because uh, of that movement in the water and he's nice and shallow and that that would be a, a real easy little probably you could just kind of loft your fly over to him and he would uh, and you would hit that so that's kind of perfect what you're looking for and all these um, examples I'm showing you now are like exaggerated right like I it was such a good view of the trout that I decided to take a picture most of it's going to be a lot harder to spot those trout than in these pictures and after you know a day of fishing these streams you kind of get what I call trout vision where you can just start naturally seeing them really well This is a cool uh, pool here. So this is my friend, Sam. It was his uh, first time fly fishing. And we were, we were able to get him a really nice rainbow, but um, he spotted one here, made a nice cast on it, but then totally blew the hook set. So I was pretty, uh, I was kind of, you know, I, I wouldn't be a good guide because I would be, um, you know, haranguing the client too much probably. But anyway, he did a good job later on. And that's about all you can expect um, when somebody's doing their, their first trip out fly fishing especially in New Zealand where it's so challenging. So he was, it was good that he got a nice fish that day. Ah, here's my, so here's my dad. Um, we hiked up a backcountry river. We were actually on a hunt for Himalayan tar, but brought the fly rod along because I knew there was a few fish in this stream. And so you can see where the backpack is over there. We spotted the fish while we were over on that side and kind of snuck down below that riffle. And then he made a great cast. And I believe he caught that on a cicada, a really nice rainbow. And um, the thing I didn't mention is those brown, the, the brown trout are amazing fighters and they will go into any sort of structure. So if there's like roots, a big boulder, they can uh, spin the line around. They will go for that and get you wrapped up. So, um, you know, they're great fighters. I even had one uh, zoom underneath like a, a cattle fence. And I thought for a minute about like diving in and trying to swim under after it, but thought better of it and he broke off. But yeah, so this is a, my dad fighting a nice rainbow and the rainbow are like the Alaskan rainbows where they, um, they're very dynamic. They'll jump, they'll, they'll shoot upstream, they'll go off down riffles. So, um, you know, they're a different fight than the brown trout, but still fun in their own way. And Sorry, the slides are lagging a little bit. I love this photo. So he, he got that fish. That was his first big one of the trip. He was pretty stoked about that. <laughs> a really nice rainbow. And a cool setting too. We, you know, we were hiking miles into this river to hunt. So, all right. Oh yeah. Okay. So, and then this one here's a one of the really nice rainbows a friend and I got. Um, and for this one, we actually mountain biked in uh, several miles, maybe five or six miles, and then had to wade across a really deep stream. And then we had this this really cool hidden uh, river all to ourselves. And um, you know, if, as long as you can get in front of or away from the competition a bit, uh, you can really find some great fishing. Here's Rick from Yakutat with his first ever brown trout. That was pretty cool. He made a nice cast and catch on that. Uh, just a couple more fish photos and then I'll move on to uh, some of the other freshwater fish species. This one, a uh, nice rainbow in the in one of the backcountry rivers. And the backcountry rivers are, um, you know, they're basically designate, designated as such because they're further out. Usually you have to hike out or get a helicopter ride to get to them. And they're, um, you know, uh, a lot of people want to go after them. So. So there's actually a few that where you have to register and they only allow a certain number of parties on during peak season. That that uh, trip there was actually a good cast and blast with that last one where we got a red, de uh, red deer stag as well. Here's one of the East Coast rivers, um, not too far from Christchurch. And you can see kind of low water, um, gravelly banks and that sort of thing, which does make it challenging with these brown trout when you got that low water, they're super wary, but there can be some nice ones in there. Okay, that's enough about trout. I'll talk a little bit more about some of the other freshwater fish briefly, and then we'll kind of wrap things up with some tips and that. And that. Um, so there are actually salmon in New Zealand, and they're also introduced. Pretty much everything's introduced there. I forgot to mention, you know, the only native mammal in New Zealand is a flightless bat. There's pretty much only birds and then some of the native fish. So most everything that people go after, whether it's hunting or fishing, or, have been introduced at some point. But these, uh, so there's sea run chinooks there. And if you see on that map on the right, 
those uh, rivers that are labeled um, with numbers and, and names. Those are the main Sea Run Chinook rivers. Um, this, the populations aren't very good. Like they're, they're pretty low numbers. So fly fishermen don't really go after them uh, too often. I tried a little bit, but never caught one. And uh, most people just target those river mouths um, when the fish are moving up. And then actually the higher up, the upper part of the rivers are usually closed to the salmon fishing to protect the spawners. Um, there's also some kokanee. Uh, you can see in that little kind of orangish bubble that I indicated on the map there, there's some lakes that have kokanee runs and you can go after them potentially. And then there's some landlocked, stocked um, Chinook salmon in, in some of the lakes as well that can be caught on the fly. Here's some pictures of different salmon fishing scenes. So that bottom left one there is a, the Wymackery River mouth near Christchurch. And you can see it almost looks like Alaska where you've got the combat fishing going on, people shoulder to shoulder. Um, and it's, I mean, people will spend hours out there and not catch much. Like I said, it's not, it's not nearly as um, productive as uh, salmon fishing in Alaska, but uh, people do really value those, the salmon for eating. Um, there's a nice one on that top right there, and you can see a lot of people take ATVs down to river mouths and with big surf casting rods. So it's not too many fly fishermen go after them. That middle uh, photo of the river there is the Waimakariri River, one of the big salmon uh, spawning rivers. And you can see how difficult it would be to try to intercept a fish somewhere along the river, which is why so most people just target the river mouths. But it's you can't really see into it because it's a little bit glacial and it's just braided out. It's hard to kind of predict where those salmon would be in there. So people mostly just target them down at the ocean. On that top left photo there is one of the lakes that has the sockeye in it. And then on the bottom right is uh, some of the landlocked Chinook that can be caught. I think those are Chinook, they might be cooking, I don't know. Um, right, uh, onto eels. And these are pretty cool fish. Um, so they're one of the few native species that are kind of big enough of, to be of interest for sport fishermen. So they're catadromous. They um, basically do kind of the, the opposite thing of salmon where they spawn out in the ocean. These guys actually swim out near Tonga in the Pacific Islands and, um, and they'll spawn out there and then the little uh, baby eels will swim back to New Zealand and swim up into the freshwater rivers. And these eels can live for over 100 years in freshwater before they go to spawn. And they can get pretty large, uh, greater than 50 inches. That one down on the bottom right there, which actually I caught for work, um, is approaching that mark. I think it was 48 inches. Now the eels are pretty scent oriented, so they're not like a, you know, a species that you can, can very easily catch on the fly. But once in a while you'll find an inquisitive one that, that's willing to hit. And usually what I had best luck with was like rabbit strip streamers where you have a little bit of leather on there that gives some scent and they like those because um, they're not, they don't see very well, but they do smell, you know, they'll go after stuff that smells like um, some people, well, it's kind of an urban legend, but people say you could put like a dirty sock in the water and the eel will bite it and you fling it out on the bank. So they just like anything that kind of smells funny. Um, yeah, and they can be caught on the fly in certain situations. You can see on that bottom right photo there, um, it's kind of those grassy banks. They like to get up under those, but once in a while you'll see them out in broad daylight, just kind of, you know, eeling along through the stream, even up in like the Alpine rivers, the big long fin eels will be up way up in, you know, up in the mountains and you can, they stick out really well there and just giant eel in this really clear stream. So if you're out trout fishing or something and you happen to see an eel, it's worth um, trying to drop a fly to them because they are pretty cool native fish to, to handle and to check out. They have a super hard mouth. So you want a sharp hook to try to um, try to get a hold of them. And then uh, they are really, really slimy and they spin around and kind of writhe like mad. So you probably want a good net. Some people use like a towel or a rag uh, to grab a hold of them to take out the fly or, or dispatch them or whatever. And you'll probably want pliers because they do have little teeth and they can draw blood. Uh, more like, almost like a burbot's teeth, you know, almost a little bit sandpapery, but enough to, to draw some blood. Here's some more eel pictures. That distribution left uh, map on the bottom left there, you can see they're pretty much everywhere uh, throughout the both the North and South Islands. And there's two different species. Uh, actually, there's three, one, one Australian species that we don't see too much, but there's short fin eel, which, been, which you'll see mostly along the coast, and then long fin eel, which will go all the way up into the mountains and, and they get a little bit bigger. That uh, photo on the bottom middle there is kind of your typical eel stream, kind of slow moving, a little deeper, lots of that nice grass on the side that they can get up under. Um, and there's some urban fishing to be done too. You can see these eels uh, in the top two photos there, just in a park in Christchurch. I was able to get a couple of them because they hang out and, and they get fed bread. So I put on like a white streamer and they nailed that to get my obligatory um, eel catch on the fly. People do eat them as well. They're really good smoked, I guess, but they are very oily and, and kind of hard to, uh, 
to uh, fillet and all that. So it's, it's not, they don't, they aren't kept too often, although they are like a, you know, a very important indigenous food. The Maori used to use them a lot, maybe a little less so now. Okay, um, some other species you can go after. So there's perch and other coarse fish are what they're called. And they call them that because their scales are rougher. Um, these are European perch and um, you can find them kind of, they're spotily distributed. Like uh, they're considered an, an invasive or um, kind of deleterious species. So people try to keep them from spreading around lots of the lakes. So there's certain lakes where they have them, but they are managed as a game fish. Um, there's perch, tench uh, and bream and even some carp, I think on the North Island. Those are tench down in the bottom right there. I never did catch them. They're kind of interesting looking fish. Um, and they, these are mainly all these coarse fish. You find them in lakes and slow moving deep streams. And you can use streamers and nymphs with uh, split shots or sink tip, just kind of stripping them around or swinging them in the deep current to get these guys. Uh, if you actually want to pursue these, kind of look on online, like on the fishing game website or in the regulations. And if you see like something that says a bag limit for perch, you probably know there's perch in there. And um, they really like structure. So if you see that photo on the top right, you can see that willow patch right behind me there. Um, that's kind of an island of willows. That was a dynamite spot every time, excuse me, we went to this lake. You just drop a streamer right there and immediately get a few perch. And the, the perch are, these are trophy size perch too. Like growing up in Montana, I'd catch a little dinky six inch perch. So being able to catch these giant perch on the, the fly was pretty exciting for me. Maybe not for other people like, you know, purist trout anglers, but I thought it was cool. This is also, uh, most of these photos were from a lake near Christchurch too. So it was a nice short um, trip to get there. Even Sarah caught a nice one there on the, on the fly. That's her. Here's some more perch fishing photos. You can see kind of nice uh, wading situation and you're just casting to structure. And there's like a river channel that flows through the, the lake there. Um, there was also sea run brown trout and, and um, resident brown trout in this lake. So once in a while I hook into them. That bottom right photo there is a, a really, really good haul one evening there. So, um, you know, quite a few perch and trout we caught that night. And those perch are amazing uh, eating, like super, they're like a rockfish, you know, they have really light uh, uh, white meat that's kind of a nice texture. Uh, we would make ceviche quite a bit with them too, which was amazing. And I'll talk just briefly about some of the other interesting native fish that aren't typically targeted on the fly, but can be. So that one on the top left there is called a giant kokapoo. They can get up to a couple pounds, I believe, uh, but nobody really goes after them because they're kind of uncommon. You only see them at night and they're very cryptic. They like to stay and cover, um, you know, under rocks, under um, debris, that sort of thing. So they're not often easily available to catch on the fly. Um, and those largest species that you'd want to go after are pretty uncommon. And there's, you know, a number of native species. There's kokapoo, galaxids, uh, bullies, torrent fish, some other ones, and I'll show pictures of those other ones on the next slide. They can be caught on the fly. And what you would do there is you'd want to go out uh, mostly to the West Coast streams, was where I've done it, with a headlamp and just kind of wade around at night and try to spot these guys. And they are pretty docile um, when you find them at night. Uh, like for research, we, were, we would just go out with a hand net and a headlamp and um, just kind of wade a stream. And they would just sit there while you, you could just net them with a short handled net. So um, I also you know, tried a little bit with some of the smaller kokapoo on the fly at night by headlamp and they were readily biting little nymphs that I was dabbling in front of them. So I think there have been a few people um, that have caught these giant kokapoo on fly, but you definitely would need to take a special trip and, and do a lot of planning um, because it's first you got to think about where they are. There's certain streams where they are and then, um, you know, kind of set up camp and, and go out there at night and make sure you don't get lost because <laughs> obviously on the West Coast, it's pretty jungly. It'd be easy to get lost out there. Here's some of those other native fish. So that top left one is a torrent fish. They like uh, the really fast moving streams. Um, and they're, I, I believe they do have a part of their life cycles in saltwater too. So they're actually related to um, blue cod, which is a saltwater bottom fish species that's very popular to catch in New Zealand. Uh, that bottom left one is a bully. They, they look a lot like sculpins and they kind of fill the same ecological niche where they're near the bottom. They're kind of small bodied and they, they hide under the rocks. Um, that top middle picture is bullies as well. And then those other uh, photos are of galaxids, that's what they're called. And there's quite a few different species of them, some of which go out to, you know, they have a, a saltwater life cycle as well. But they're all pretty pretty small and not really notable for going after for um, fly fishing anyway. All right, so that's kind of a 
overview of all those different fish species. Um, I'll just go over a few tips for the regulations, um, the seasons there, and you know what you want to think about if you're going to consider getting guided. So you need a license to fish for the trout and the coarse fish, but you don't need one for saltwater species. But if you're fishing like at a river mouth, you want to make sure you're well out into the saltwater area um, if you don't have a freshwater license. And just like in Alaska here, you're always going to want to check the regulations for specific water bodies. Um, they vary uh, you know, be uh, between regions and then also between rivers and lakes. The main trout season in New Zealand is from October to March, which is their summer. And um, the backcountry rivers and some of the, the more hard hit rivers like the, the Ahariri River, which is one of New Zealand's best known trout rivers, that one doesn't even open until December. So it can be pretty short seasons for some of them. Um, and then there are rivers like the one I showed with uh, the European nymphing guys and the cow pasture, they're open year round. And those are nice too, because you can go, well, I mean, if you're just visiting, you're probably going to want to go there in the summer. But if you happen to find yourself there in the winter, there are options that you can go after some trout. Um, as far as guides go, I'd say it's worth hiring a guide. And there's not a lot of guides, and they, I think they do charge a, a premium. But it's worth hi hiring one if you're there um, for just a couple of days and you don't have time to kind of like get into, like immerse yourself into the fishing yourself. Like let's say you're on a sightseeing trip there and the missus is going shopping one day and that's your day to go fishing. Um, you probably won't gonna wanna hire a guide just to get the maximum amount of, of success because they know exactly where to go. Uh, they'll get you right to the spot you need to be and for casting and they'll supply you with the best um, flies and all that. And that, that goes for trout and for the, the flats amberjack fishing. And also the guides that um, go for the amberjack oftentimes have boats and that can really be useful to get you away from the competition because it does get a little busy out there um, sometimes and there's only kind of limited uh, area of flats to, to utilize. Here's so just some general fishing tips. I found this, um, this website called NZ Topo was really useful. You can look at rivers, access points, trails, huts, um, all the roads. And it's kind of like Google Earth where you can zoom in and out and it, the resolution gets better as you zoom in and out. And that's free online if you just Google NZ Topo. Uh, you can get a lot of great info there. Um, also, you can search water bodies of interest on nzfishing.com. And that gives you like the regulations and the access points and some kind of brief tips on fishing those places. Um, the people who fish there are pretty closed mouth about their spots and you're not going to, you know, you, you can find some information on forums, but if you ask anybody, they're definitely not going to give you good, you know, the best spots. They might give you some really general rivers or lakes that kind of everybody knows about that you might catch some fish on. So it's worth trying to do some online sleuthing and, you know, talking to people that have been there, particularly international anglers like me that have less, um, I guess, investment in keeping those spots secret because they don't fish them as regularly, so they might be willing to let slip some info more readily. Um, and then you want to be mindful of angler etiquette when you're in New Zealand too. New Zealand anglers expect a lot of space, and that kind of is a, a function of um, how spooky those trout are. Like, basically, if somebody shows up at a, an access point, it's kind of first come, first served, and starts uh, fishing their way up a river, it's very rude um, to cut in front of them at any point unless there's another access point, you know, maybe a few miles, at least a few miles upstream that you can start at. Uh, because if you're going in front of somebody and fishing, you're basically spooking every fish. So, uh, you know, I kind of learned that the hard way when I first got there and made some faux pas, but it's good to know and always good to be respectful. And usually if you just chat to an angler, like if you um, get to a, an access point and there's somebody that's just arrived there and rigging up, you might even, um, if it's a kind fisherman, they might even like take you under their wing and bring you along. So. It's worth just talking to people and, and not being a, an a-hole is basically what it boils down to. Um, that kind of applies to the amberjack too, the fishery too. You kind of want to keep a couple hundred yards between you and other fishermen if possible. Obviously, you know, if you're chasing a fish or trying to get to a different um, destination, then you, you're going to have to cut through their area, but try to go over to the bank and not into the area where they're fishing. Uh, it's very, very important to wear sunblock and sun protective clothing in New Zealand, especially if you're coming from winter here in Alaska, where some of us haven't seen sun for months, right? So um, our skin's pretty sensitive. And down there uh, in Australia and New Zealand, there's a, kind of a lack of ozone. There's a hole in the ozone layer. So that sun is brutal down there. Um, if you go outside for five minutes, you get burned. So it's very, very important to wear sunblock and sun protective clothing. And you're going to need the good polarized sunglasses for either trout fishing or the amberjack fishing because you really, really need to see into the water. 
Um, for trout fishing, the further you hike, the better. Uh, there's all those trails, like I mentioned, and all those backcountry huts that are only like five to $20 a night to stay in. So it's a pretty sweet deal. So if you can get out there and get away from people, you're going to find better fishing up to a point. Um, there's a lot of helicopter fishing that occurs. So if you go hike out too far, you're getting into the spots where people are dropping off uh, helicopter fishing clients. And that's really no fun if you've you know hiked hours or days to get to a spot and all of a sudden the helicopter drops some uh, uh, fat tourists right in front of you on the river. That's that's no fun. So it can you know you kind of got to be strategic about where you go. And uh, sometimes some of it just comes down to luck, and it's always first come first served. Um, so you know the best th best way to do is just strike out there and, and give it a try. Most people wear muted colors, and then like I said, you want to move really slowly so you're not spooking the fish. Try not to try to crouch down um, if you're stalking a fish. Don't you know make big movements, kick around rocks, splash around. Obviously, try to just like you're. It's almost like you're hunting. You want to stalk your prey and, and be really stealthy. And then like I mentioned. Do a lot of casting practice before you go. Um, try to get really accurate with those long, thin leaders and, and uh, heavy nymphs, which is tough. And then try to do it with wind too, if you can, because oftentimes you're gonna be dealing with that wind, which can really um, disrupt your casting if you're not kind of compensating for it. So I can't stress that enough. Um, if you if you wanna be successful, if you go over there, definitely do a lot of casting practice because trying to, to you know, kind of learn the ropes when you arrive is going to be a losing proposition unless you're there for weeks or something where you'd have time to get into the swing of things. And that's typically not the case with most people. You might be there for a week or a few days or whatever. Um, yeah, and then sight fishing, you're going to want like calm weather and direct sunlight is best so you can see down into the river. It's possible to do okay without that, but that's ideal conditions, especially if there's a lot of wind, you're just not going to be able to see trout and you might as well just go home. So. Uh, the good thing about the South Island is there's a lot of diverse um, regions. So the weather is likely good somewhere. And I'll just pull the map up again. And so you've got that really narrow island with all these different kind of eco regions very close together. So it's a pretty short drive relatively to anywhere on the South Island. So what I would kind of do if I had a weekend free is I'd look, pull up the forecast for different areas and say, oh, okay, it's stormy on the West Coast this week. It's not looking great. It's going to be windy um, on the East Coast. Maybe I'll go north and try, you know, something up, up near Golden Bay or whatever. So there's usually an, an option somewhere to find good fishing, um, unless there's like a big monsoon coming through where everywhere is bad weather, which does happen. Um, and I did mention occasionally you can go after um, fish with uh, mice, mice flies. And that's usually on certain years where the native beech trees, um, I guess they produce a lot of seeds. And so there's what's known as mouse years where the, the trout get really, really big because they've been eating mice uh, for the past few months. So you're getting like 10 to 20 pound trout that are in the rivers where normally they'd be a lot skinnier. And you can uh, go out, you know, in evenings and potentially uh, catch them on these mice flies on those certain years and certain rivers. I never hit it right. I don't think there was a mouse year while I was there and I was there for, you know, three years. So it didn't happen for me. But, um, and then there's also, you know, some possible hatch matching, like I mentioned, but uh, most of it's just there's insects coming off or in the water, um, not at a, a fast rate of a hatch. And so you're just trying different things in your box, but not really matching insects in the water. That's a really cool um, native New Zealand stonefly up on the right there, a stenoperla. They're bright green as adults and nymphs. That was one of my favorite critters there just because of how, how beautiful they are, in my opinion, I guess. I mean, not everybody would think a bug is beautiful, but I do. <laughs> Um, also, there is sand flies there, and they're, they're equivalent to like our noceums or black flies here in Alaska. They're pretty brutal. Um, the, they really itch their bites and they, they'll get red and raised. So you definitely want to bring repellent and wear uh, long sleeves and like a buff, that sort of thing, something to kind of keep them off of you. You can see in that bottom right picture, I'm not sure if you can see it very well, but that, that's a tent, uh, pitch tent along the, one of the fishing rivers, and there's just sand flies crowding the mesh on the outside. Um, and certain rivers are worse than others, uh, it seems, but you can, can't really depend on it unless you have talked to somebody who's fished it recently and they kind of give you an idea of what you can expect for the sand flies. But that repellent is, is very key. And you can get some nice stuff there called Bushman that you just, it's like lotion you put on. Uh, it's pretty, pretty good. Because um, you don't want to be like stalking a giant trout, trying to move really slow and, and there's a sand fly boring into your wrist while you're trying to cast. It's just not a good time. So it's definitely good to have that repellent. And uh, so wet wading is popular there in New Zealand, but you can use waders too. 
um, if you're like, you know, fishing in the winter or somewhere deep or it's a cold day, but I always try to wet weight if possible, just wearing my, my wading boots. Um, and you, they really stress cleaning your gear, like your wading boots, your waders between streams, because there, there are a few invasive plants and species there and they want to prevent them from getting into new rivers like this uh, didymo algae, it's called rock snot. It can really uh, ruin a trout stream, like it just clogs up the stream. So they're really trying to keep that um, from getting into new rivers. Okay, that's about it for fishing tips. Travel tips, just before we close here, this is the last thing. Um, so if you can, I would say travel through Hawaii or Australia um, is the best way to do it if you're, if you're going there. Don't get one of the flights that are cheaper, but like take you through Dubai or China or something that it's just too much time traveling, you know, almost like a full day or more of traveling if you go um, with one of those flights. And so like if you take um, a flight through Hawaii or through Australia or even through Fiji, it's, you know, uh, probably 13 to 17 hours of travel between the flights and the layovers. And that's kind of your best case scenario. Um, the Fiji Airways was the one I, I did quite a bit because it was a little cheaper, but also a pretty good connection. But New Zealand Air is, or Air New Zealand is kind of the best um, air service to, to get there, although a little more expensive. And then Qantas, if you're going through Australia, is decent. Be really mindful of the biosecurity checkpoint that they have when you enter New Zealand. Um, they're really worried about invasive species in their country because there's been so much in the past. They're just trying to make sure that nothing new gets into their country. So all your outdoor gear, they're going to check with a fine tooth comb to make sure there's no seeds, no dirt, nothing like that on there. So make sure you clean your outdoor gear really well before you travel you don't want to be it's kind of stressful when you're going through like the checkpoints you've just gone through passport control now you got this biosecurity checkpoint it's not really a mellow situation and you don't want to be like scrambling to scrub stuff off of your gear because um, if it's too bad and you can't clean it off effectively they'll throw it away and you don't want to have to be buying new gear in new zealand because it's probably three times more expensive than you would buy any sort of outdoor gear in the states uh, as far as getting around once you get there it's uh, most people rent cars and the car rentals are pretty cheap. If you have a little more cash and you're staying there longer, a camper van is a cool way to go. Then you're pretty much all self-contained. There's a, you get a little toilet with your camper van and that allows you to camp in a lot more places because they're kind of cutting down on what they call freedom camping, which is people who are camping without a, a toilet in their vehicle. Because unfortunately, a lot of tourists have uh, been using the bathroom just in campsites and not you know taking the time to cover that up. So they've kind of ruined it for everybody. So it's Kind of hard to camp just in your tent these days you have to have like a camper van or go to a, a, a campsite that has a, a toilet but, um so that's a good very good option although a little more expensive and, and sometimes they get booked up quickly so if you're going to go you want to try to book one uh way in advance rental car you can get on pretty spur of the moment and they're very cheap also a lot of you know younger folks that don't have a lot of money hitchhike and that's totally safe there and tons of people do it and you can get around most everywhere you need to go as far as places to stay, um, there's a lot of variety. There's campsites, those backcountry and front country huts, and then hostels. The campsites and huts are good options, and you can find those, you know, way in the backcountry to even alongside the road. They're like five to, you know, thirty dollars a night usually, depending on how much in demand they are. And then the hostels. There's a hostel in almost every um, small town because of all the international travelers and those are real cheap like 30 to 40 dollars New Zealand dollars a night and then you do have like a dorm style room and you can take a shower and stuff and those trails and public roads are really extensive they'll get you almost anywhere you desire there's almost too much access which is you know a complete 180 from what we have in Alaska here where we have very limited road and trail access um, pretty much you can get anywhere in New Zealand with that with those uh, those trails yeah so just uh, kind of closing thoughts. Um, it's an amazing place to spend some time. You know, it's before COVID, um, you could get a visa or you wouldn't even need a visa as an American to stay there for, I think, up to a month. And you can easily stay there for, you know, several months if you really have a lot of time and want to immerse yourself <clears throat> in the culture. If you're under 30, you can get a working holiday visa, which is good for a year. And you can also work while you're there. So that's a cool option too. Um, but yeah, I mean, world-class fishing, both in freshwater and saltwater, you can't go wrong there. I highly recommend it. It's challenging, but uh, just amazing landscapes and, uh, and and huge fish too. So that's about that. If anybody has any questions, um, I'd be happy to field those. You can also uh, hit me up at the email there. And, and if you plan on going, I'm, I'll, I'll be happy to share some tips to you. So thanks.
Hey, Kevin, this is Fred. Hey, Fred. I have to ask you uh, where one photo was taken uh, with the, it was nice calm water early on and there were three black cattle cows. Yeah. Uh, in the photo. Um, it was West Coast River, you said. Okay, yeah, was it the one with uh, the, the uh, European emperors in it? Uh, no, it was before that. Oh. Um, the cows? With the cows. Let me check. Yeah, I'm not sure if I see that one, but um, the one with the cows in it that I'm thinking of was the Arnold River, which is a, um, oh. mm. it, it's a large river over on the west coast there that's open year round. That one I don't mind giving away because that's a, a spot that is uh, very, has a ton, a really high density of brown trout. So there's tons of them in there. Yeah, I've never fished it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, Maybe that, next time. <laughs> yeah, that was my uh, go-to fish, um, go-to river in the winter because it was directly just over the divide from Christchurch. It was right by Greymouth. So uh, mm -hmm. it was a short drive and then also good angler access points and lots of fish. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. We need to get together for a visit as soon as this COVID will allow. Yeah, that'd be great. I'd love to, to hear more about where you've been there. Kevin, oh. you may have covered this, um, but I had a question regarding uh, public land, and you may have already covered this. I came in late, um, but and not necessarily for fishing, but like if you were to, if you were to try and go chase, you know, whatever sheep tar, you know, red deer and stuff like that. Um, and in the at that is is uh, is the fishing half decent? And I would imagine those hunting seasons are in the in the like fall to winter and is the fishing good at the same time sort of because you said something about a cast and you know where you guys were chasing stag and um and fish so uh is is like i just i just tried to go you know i did some hunting in hawaii just recently and it was just it was just so frustrating um there's just so little public property and it's just so the opposite of what we experience here so i was kind of curious what new zealand is as far as access is concerned and public property as opposed to it seemed like from what i've seen a lot of it's private you know ranches and stuff like that but is there is there is there decent hunting opportunities also on public property yeah good question i didn't cover that um actually there's a ton of public land in new zealand and there's like big blocks of land that the department of conservation opens for hunting um, and also most uh, riverbeds are, have like a public access corridor. It's called the Queen's Chain. It's kind of a European throwback thing that got uh, implemented in New Zealand, but basically you have a, you know, a right of way to get to public lands by walking river corridors. Um, and so if you just go to the Department of Conservation website and, and like look at their, they have an interactive mapper and that shows you all their um, conservation lands and whether you can hunt in them or not. And then usually just get a free uh, registration permit online for the, the area that you want to hunt. Um, but yeah, actually the opportunities are really good. There's a few places like in Fjordland where you have to apply um, for a ballot hunt is what it's called. And then you get like a, a time period where you have to go there. And you, but then you can hunt whatever you want during that time. But most of it's just open access hunting. Um, the one challenge is um, to have a firearm there. You need to have somebody with a firearms license um, or I'm not sure what paperwork you need to do if you're bringing one from out of the country. But uh, yeah, so, um, and actually there's no closed season for hunting in New Zealand. <laughs> ah, okay. So, um, so, you know, we would go in, in midsummer for those tar and, um, that was my favorite thing to do is a cast and blast where there was a little bit of hunting to do and a little bit of fishing. So there's a lot of places where that's possible, where you got a nice, um, river that also has a lot of good game habitat. Okay. I know in, in yeah. Hawaii, it's the same. You can't, um, you can't, well, if you bring a right, if you bring up gunning, you have to register within 24 hours and all this outrageously bizarre stuff regarding firearms. But, but so what I usually do is take a bow. Do you know if there's anything about bow and arrows? No, that, that, that would be a good way to go because you wouldn't have to do any of that paperwork. I think you could easily just bring a bow or buy okay. one there. You don't need a firearms license for that. So, okay, cool. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Those uh, and, uh, I was going to say this part everything potentially a good bow hunting quarry because you, even though they're alpine, you can get pretty close to them. Okay. And everything you're hunting is invasive vermin. Yeah, that's right. <laughs>
Yeah, I could do a whole presentation about the hunting I did over there too. You've got, you know, Himalayan tar, the red deer, fallow deer, wallaby, a lot of wild pigs. You know, there's a couple of fishing trips we did where we got wild pigs on the river bottom along with our fishing trips. So. Yeah, that'd be great to hear about. Evan and I just got back from getting some uh, Spanish goats and wild pigs in yeah. Hawaii. That's awesome. They consider them, and nobody really likes them over there too. You're kind of doing people favors, whacking yeah. them in their clothes and stuff, so. That's the same in New Zealand, especially with the pigs. They kind of tear up things. So. Yeah. Well, cool. Yeah. Okay. Anything else, folks? Otherwise, we'll go ahead and wrap things up. Well, thanks for tuning in, everybody. Again, if you have any questions, definitely send me an email. Um, and if you haven't, check us out on our, our social media pages. And consider becoming a, a member of the, the club. It's only $25 for an individual or family. That's good for one year. Um, and, you know, that money goes towards our uh, kids camp and other club activities. So it goes to a good place. Hey, thanks, oh, thanks. All right. Thanks, guys. I'm going to go ahead and end the meeting. Well, thanks, thanks, Kevin. Awesome All right, Bye, Kevin. Bye, Mom. <laughs> <laughs>